This is Models in Quantum Mechanics on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. All right, in this video we're going to discuss the basics of the quantum harmonic oscillator model, and then we're going to go into an example of how you determine what the wave function to use is when presented with a harmonic oscillator problem. First of all, what is a quantum harmonic oscillator? What we're going to do is we're going to imagine some molecule that's linear. So for example, um, we can Im imagine diatomic chlorine, so that's two chlorine atoms that are connected by one covalent bond. Um, we can also imagine uh, this molecule that's going to appear on the screen, something like carbon dioxide, even though it has three atoms, it's still linear, and we have two outer oxygen atoms, and whichever molecule that we visualize, what's going to happen is the two atoms on the ends, regardless of which one you're talking about, are going to stretch and compress, stretch and compress. They're going to oscillate towards each other and away from each other, back and forth, over and over again. And so that's what a harmonic oscillator basically is. It's just an oscillator that's on the quantum scale in general terms. Okay? Now, Without going into any interpretation of the quantum number and all that stuff, let's talk about what you really need to know for now. This right here in my mouse is this is the very general wave function of the quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay, um, A lot of times you'll see the wave function xi written in terms of some variable that could be y or z. Um, what we'll find is that this wave function can actually be written in terms of x. It can be written in terms of another variable, which some sources will have as a y, some as a z. I'm choosing y here. So the wave function xi as a function of y is equal to the product of three separate terms. We need to talk about what those are. This first term that has a one-half power superscript right here, this square root, all of this in parentheses, this is the normalization constant. Right? So the normalization constant has an alpha, which we'll talk about in a minute, to the one-half power, divided by pi to the one-half power, divided by 2 to the n, and divided by n factorial. And so if you normalize the quantum harmonic oscillator wave function, you get this normalization constant. And we'll talk about the alpha in just a minute. We also have the Hermite polynomial. So a Hermite polynomial is something that you have to look up. In other words, you have to be given these or have to have some way to look these up. I doubt any professor is going to have you memorize all of these, but the point is don't get confused by this H, this Hermite polynomial. H is a function of Y. You look these up in a table, and here's a table of some of these tabulated as a function of Y, some parameter. Okay, That's your second term. Your last term is always the same. You're always going to have what's called this Gaussian term. It's a Gaussian exponential term. We have e to the negative y squared over 2. And when you're constructing your quantum harmonic oscillator wave function, you just take the Gaussian function, you take the Hermite polynomial, the appropriate one, and you take the normalization constant, multiply them all together, and that's your wave function. So unfortunately, with the quantum harmonic oscillator, you can't just memorize a bunch of wave functions like we could with particle in a box. You actually have to kind of construct this based on the information you're given. So for example, we have different energy levels here given by n. Now this n is not the same n that we saw in the particle in the box model. Remember, that n could not be 0. That n started with 1. This is not the same n. It just is a confusing thing. But suppose we have an n of 1. Let's say our n is 1. Well, when we set up our wave function, let's first deal with the normalization constant. We'll have our alpha to the 1 half, pi to the 1 half, and then for every n, we're just going to plug in 1. So 2 to the first would be 2. 1 factorial is just 1. Okay. So that's dealing with the normalization constant. For the Hermite polynomial, we just, if we know n is 1, we just come to this table and we pick the appropriate one. So 2y, so this h is a function of y, we would just replace that with a 2y. And then this exponential term, the Gaussian term, just comes along for the ride. It does not change. It is as it is. All right? Now, what is alpha? Well, alpha is a couple of things. First of all, alpha can be expressed with x. So you notice that this wave function is in terms of some parameter called y. The reason they put this y here is it minimizes the amount of alphas that you have to have. Because when you express this wave function in terms of x, it turns out that y is equal to the square root of alpha times x. 
So what I've done here is now I've made the substitution for all the y's that you see for square root of alpha times x. So now we can actually write the wave function as a function of x. The normalization constant out in front doesn't change. That's not affected because it's not a function of y or x. The Hermite polynomial, you still have to pick it from this list, but everywhere you see a y, you'll replace that with alpha to the one-half times x. We'll look at an example of that in just a couple of minutes. And then the exponential term, the y squared, gets replaced by the quantity alpha to the one-half x quantity squared, which turns out to be alpha x squared. All right. So we'll look at an example of how you set that up in just a minute. But another thing, alpha, if you want to solve for its value, you have to know the reduced mass of the, of the molecule. This m, I really should have this as mu because this should be the reduced mass, which is the product of the two particles. So if you have something like chlorine, it would be the mass of the first chlorine atom times the mass of the second chlorine atom, and then you divide by the sum of their masses. Reduced mass is basically a form of mass that you use when the when you have two particles that are connected in some way, when it's not just one discrete particle. Okay, So this really should be mu, but alpha equals mu times k, which is the force constant, divided by h bar squared, and you take the square root of that. Understand this. Depending on the source you use, whether it's textbook or some other videos or whatnot, alpha can be defined a little bit differently. Some people define y as being x divided by alpha, in which case this value of alpha changes. So you have to know how alpha is defined in your particular wave function, because some sources define it differently. You'll get the same answer, but it's just that if you, if you have y equal to x divided by alpha, then this alpha actually changes. And they've actually seen some sources that actually do that. Okay. The energy eigenvalue that you get when you solve the Schrodinger equation for the quantum harmonic oscillator, the energy is equal to the quantity n plus a half times h bar times omega, which is the angular frequency. Okay, And also note that the angular frequency is equal to 2 pi times the frequency, which is just the linear frequency, which is also equal to the square root of the force constant divided by the reduced mass. And we'll do some other problems later on with actually calculating the energy, its actual value, and it depends on what information you're given as to which uh, of these formulas precisely that you're actually going to use. All right, so now hopefully you have some understanding of what each piece is. Let's actually do an example. All right, here's our problem. We want to construct the harmonic oscillator wave function for the energy level n equals 2. All right, now here is my general formula for the wave function xi as a function of y. I also have my table of Hermite polynomials down here, which I'm going to use to do that. Now, let's first look at the normalization constant. And it's remember, an energy level n equals 2. So we have alpha to the 1 half, down here pi to the 1 half. We're going to replace the n's with 2 because we're at n equals 2. So 2 to the second power and then we have 2 factorial. Okay, And I'm not going to go ahead and solve these numbers right now. We're just setting it up. But this is how you would set up the normalization constant. If we were at n equals 3, it would be 2 to the third times 3 factorial. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. So we're just going to do this piecewise. Next, let's deal with the Hermite polynomial. So the second Hermite polynomial as a function of y, we just come down here and look at the table. It's 4y squared minus 2. So that's our polynomial, 4y squared minus 2. Now, what I'm also going to do, because I eventually want to set it up as a function of x, I'm going to basically, where everywhere I see a y, I'm going to make the substitution alpha to the 1 half times x. So wherever I see this y, I'm going to plug in square root of alpha times x. And when you simplify this, you get that the Hermite polynomial at energy level 2 as a function of x is equal to 4 alpha times x squared minus 2. Okay, This is the same Hermite polynomial as this one, except this one is as a function of x, which also carries an alpha with it. Our Gaussian function is just our Gaussian function. So it comes along for the ride. It's equal to the exponential of negative y squared over 2. Now, in the way we're defining alpha, this is just for the way we're defining alpha, we can make the substitution with y. So everywhere I see a y, I need to replace it with 
alpha to the one half x. So that Gaussian function can also be written as the exponential of negative alpha x squared over two. Okay. Now that I have my three pieces here, I'm ready to set up my total wave function. So the second energy level wave function as a function of y, the normalization constant is the same for both of these. So I just have my normalization constant. And then I multiply it times the Hermite polynomial, 4y squared minus 2. And then I just tag this Gaussian function along at the end. Okay, And that's my wave function as a function of y. Um, now, if you're doing any kind of problems with these, like probability, all those integrals and stuff, you can imagine this is going to be kind of a pain to integrate, and you're probably going to want to use a table of integrals to do these. Okay, Just fair warning on that. Now let's actually determine the second energy level wave function as a function of x. Again, the normalization constant doesn't change. It's the same between both of these. But my Hermite polynomial, remember, does change because I have to substitute out the y's with square root of alpha times x. So I already calculated what that polynomial is. It's 4 alpha x squared minus 2. So I just throw that in down here and multiply it. And then again, my Gaussian function comes along for the ride. But again, I have to make that substitution. So I have to do exponential negative alpha x squared divided by 2. And this is now your wave function as a function of x. And again, it really just depends on what information you're given. If you're given boundary conditions that are in terms of y, then maybe you'll want to leave it like this. If you're given boundary conditions in terms of x, then maybe you'll want to go to the work of actually converting the wave function to a function of x. But just keep in mind that you have these alphas here. And then if you want to get an exact value for whatever parameter you're calculating, you need to actually calculate what alpha is. And in the way we've defined alpha here, this is how you do it. Alpha is equal to the reduced mass, remember, times the force constant divided by the square of, of the reduced Planck's constant, and then take the square root of that, and that's your alpha. Okay. So hopefully this video gave you a little bit of intuition on what the quantum harmonic oscillator is, and then also how to construct your wave function from the basic formula right here as both functions of y and x. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure to like and subscribe. In the next video, we're going to do an example where we determine the zero-point energy and also the energy spacing of this model. Thank you.